Welcome to the Spirit of a Badass, where we celebrate stories of courage, hope, and resiliency. I'm your host, Alicia Jacobson. Hey there, badasses. Welcome to today's podcast. I'm so excited for you to get a chance to listen to my guest today. My guest, Trisha, was mentioned on episode 10 with Katie Post. Trisha is a financial coach. And a lot of the women that I work with, whenever we kind of get into the financial space, my next referral is, hey, I have this financial coach that I would like you to get in touch with. She has a wonderful story that I am excited for you to hear. So we are going to get right in. Trisha is a regional vice president of a software sales for a publicly traded company. Some of Trisha's free time is spent working with clients in the financial coaching arena. In particular, she likes to work with women in helping with financial organization and their goals. She learned to manage a budget and financial projections for her company through her various leadership roles in corporate settings. So welcome, Trisha. We are talking all about the Benjamins today. I love it. Yes, absolutely. Such a big part of our world. Oh my gosh, it is. Everything kind of feels like it revolves around it, yet nobody talks about it. Right. We don't talk about it enough, I would say, just based on what I've experienced and the people I get the opportunity to work with. Yeah. We're going to dive in just deep here. What called you to get into this type of coaching? Yeah. Uh, Well, so years ago, I was a divorced mom with a two-year-old and a three-year-old. I was in corporate America and I was working away. And here I am divorced with these two little kids. And I got the, you know, kind of final judgment around how much maintenance and how much child support I'd have to pay. So when I got those numbers, like a lot of people, you can get very overwhelmed when you have that kind of disruptive event in your life. And for me, it was, oh my gosh, how am I going to make ends meet? How am I going to support these children? How am I going to support this other household? Like, how do you do all that? And I was extremely overwhelmed, depressed, sad, Um, just trying to get up and take care of these two kids and get to work. And I think that's when you can let finances get out of control. You can whatever. I fortunately was the vice president of marketing for a manufacturing company at that time. So I had to do a budget for our marketing events. So I knew budgeting. I knew that. So I just took that and was like, gosh, this is the time I have to apply this to my personal life as well. So I turned around and just had to really step through and teach myself how to be very organized with money. No longer could it be the loose, just spending a few dollars here and there because my new world was this very disruptive new place for me as a divorced single mom and with all these financial responsibilities. So it was, that was the basis. That was the genesis of it. And from there, really, I, I didn't get into coaching until almost a decade and a half later. So it was just really me getting these kids grown and figuring it all out. And coming up with systems and things that helped me feel confident and in control. Because there were days I did not feel like that. There were days being scared because it's Thursday, payday's Friday, and there's only a fourth of tank of gas and you have no money in your checking account, right? Those feelings are scary. And when you're scared, you do things that you, you, you do things like have insomnia. You don't sleep well. You don't eat well. All those things. So it's really, really important, I think for your physical health and your mental health to to figure out how to get financially organized. And it's not always easy. You know, we don't learn these things growing up a lot of times. I would say that I swung around and really liked to focus on women because I was a single woman. (laughs) So I really like to help women. But in that journey, I also learned men and women have very different experiences growing up with money and the messages they get. And it's really interesting to me because that's always where we start is kind of like, so tell me about growing up with money. What messages did you get? And a lot of women will say things like, well, gosh, my mom really just seemed to have money, but I don't know where it came from. And we would get stuff, but I knew money was tight, but I didn't know why it was tight. Or my dad paid for everything. I didn't really see anybody talking about it. Nobody talked about it. So I got through college. They paid for everything. I got a car. They paid for college or I didn't get to go to college because there wasn't money. So it's like it was always kind of this mystery. And then all of a sudden you're an adult and it's like you take all these kind of anxieties and things and messages you got around money. And there you are trying to adult. (laughs) Now what? 
Yes. I remember when I moved out, I was shocked that there was like the bills that came for like heat. <laughs> like it was the, how I knew that you had to pay for things was if you don't turn the light off, I'm going to start charging you like a dollar every time I left the light on. But I really didn't understand. Like it wasn't ever talked about like, oh, you pay monthly for these bills. These are things that my family growing up, yeah, it was never discussed. Yes. And so it leaves this impression that now as adults, kind of like we we said at the very beginning, people don't talk about it. Well, why don't we talk about it? Because we never talked about it in our families. We never heard anybody talk about it. We didn't hear healthy money conversations. If anything, you might feel anxiety or stress because maybe there was a money problem and nobody was talking about it. So there was this underlying current of, well, we can't have this, or we can't afford that, or we can't do this, which are also not great messages, right? So, you know, as I've gotten older, I learned one of the things to never say to my children is we don't have money for that, right? Things might have been tight, but I can budget and I can figure out the money for that. It might be, it's not in the budget this month, but we'll figure it out. So that's, that I found for kids is a better message than the scarcity of like, there's not enough money. I don't have the money. So it's like, how do you start to have those conversations? So you're changing the generations, you know, our upcoming generations, so they have more confidence. And it's important for kids to get confidence, I think, about money at a young age. And they can only do that if we're guiding that conversation and helping them to understand how it works. Yeah. For most of us, money is not infinite, right? And so there, it has to be, you know, it's like, mom, I want a yacht. Well, we're not getting a yacht this month. <laughs> it's on the budget this month. Right. Yes, exactly. Nor maybe in the next 10 years. Yeah, right. How do you suggest, because this for so many is something that they don't talk about at all. And just looking at my upbringing, like I grew up very poor and it was not necessarily like we don't have money for that. I just knew, like, I don't ever remember my mom saying we can't afford that or I can't afford that. I just knew not even really to ask. And with my kids now, you know, then I went through a divorce and again, didn't have the funds to really pay for anything because I had been a stay at home mom and then was like, now all of a sudden I am in charge of feeding these two beings and keeping them like surviving. And that was like, I definitely had the scarcity mindset because that wasn't even something that I'd really started thinking about yet. So I find myself even now saying, because you know, raising teenagers, I think every day it's, can I have 20 bucks for this or I need new shoes? So I find myself saying like, I don't have, I don't have the funds for that right now. And so as, you know, people who have grown up with this sort of scarcity mindset, or we don't talk about money, maybe it's taboo, or how do you suggest that parents would start changing the narrative when it comes to finances? Yeah, I think there's a couple of great things and research has shown this really at a, starting at a young age. So having kids earn money. So they start to equate the work, you know, kind of the days of, oh, you just get an allowance because you're alive and you breathe air. Those days are they've shifted and said, you know, that's not the healthiest because that doesn't just happen. We have to go to work to earn our money. So really make it a commission based type of thing or a per job. You know, you go and you, you pull the weeds and you get $10. And some people I've found successfully in my coaching do it where, hey, you're going to get this $50, say, at the beginning of the month. And it's, you know, obviously dependent on age. You don't give a three-year-old $50. Yeah. And you say, here are the things that need to be accomplished in the month. So you need to get these things done, whether it's weed, whether it's, you know, vacuum the house each week, whatever it is, they have their list of things they have to do. And if they don't complete those, then you sit down, you have the conversation of, hey, you didn't do your job well. So you're not going to get this full amount the next month. So you, you start to have these conversations. So it's equate work and money. And if you don't work, you don't get money. So that's one thing. So really that commission versus just an allowance. But then with that, with that money, it's the next step of the conversation of there's three things you can do with money. You can spend it, you can save it, and you can give it. And you need to do all three. So all three are very, very important to get the muscle around each of those not just spending it, but also saving it and also giving it, right? So you want to develop all those muscles. And it's like you start at a young age. Really, you know, what I've seen successfully happen is people will have three different piggy banks and might put that on there, that kind of thing. So it's like getting them to think in terms of like there's buckets and starting off with three is much easier than 
oh, I have a budget with 20 line items. <laughs> so yeah, so that's really the suggestions that people who have been researching this or finding for kids help create, start creating the healthy, you know, kind of money habits, if you will. Yeah. When women come to you, how are they financially? Not meaning like, what are their numbers, but like, how do they feel about finances? And then when they are wrapping up with you, what's different? Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that we discredit, and and again, just kind of going back to studies, they're starting to find more and more, more, uh, I guess in the last year, even around the amount of debt you have, there is a direct correlation to the amount of anxiety you feel. And it's interesting because again, people don't talk about that. And it's very American to when you want something, say, well, what's the payment for that, right? What's going to be my payment? And they said, what we don't realize is we're really robbing ourselves of sleep by asking that question. The question should be, how much is it? And then you should say, can I buy all of that? This month? Can I buy it all right now? And if you can't, don't buy it. But setting yourself up with payments, each payment you have, just consider it the anxiety meter goes up a notch. Each payment, whether it's $30, $50, that they're finding more and more that our, our system, our American culture of car payments, um, payments for furniture, payments now for clothes online, whatever it is, is causing more anxiety than they ever realized. And it robs you of sleep. And you don't know why. Because you're doing what is culturally very accepted and sold to us. Even longer payments. Hey, instead of a three-year car payment, now you can have a seven-year car payment. Really? You know, so it's just the amount of stress for seven years you just signed up for. And we normal, we try to normalize it. So I'd say when people, to answer your question, when people come to me, that it is because they're so anxious and they have no one to really understand how anxious they are. And they feel scared and they feel out of control. So the main goal through just really working is like, let's get organized and let's create a plan because you feel hopeless when you don't have a plan when you don't have a path, you know, that's when hopelessness starts, sets in. And that's when depression sets in. So it's like, they're tired of feeling hopeless and they're tired of being tired. <laughs> so the goal is really getting them to understand this does impact your mental health. You can pretend it doesn't by not talking about it, but it does. And so how do we baby step our way or gradually get our way? Cause you know, everybody wants that quick fix. And I'm always like, I'm going to tell you, Again, research shows 12 to 18 months to dig yourself out of a place where you have fewer payments, so you have more room to breathe, and you know what your path is going forward, and you have goals for where you want to be when you retire. 12 to 18 months? 12 to 18 months. Okay. Now, that, I mean, because if you zoom out and look at, like, the big overall picture of life, that's not that much time. A couple things here. With the anxiety... People are in the doctor's office all the time. Or, you know, when I start working with people, the stress and anxiety, lack of sleep are top three. Yep. And financially, if that is impacting that, I mean, if you can zoom out and think 12 to 18 months, you could make a huge, huge impact on your overall health and well-being and financial impact if you kind of eyes wide open and take a look at that because that's something when I work with people, they don't want, they're very resistant. They'll look at some things, but the, this financial piece, it's like, I don't want to go there. Almost like if I have my blinders on, it, it's not really real. So for those people who either they don't have the information or they feel like it's safer to sort of have their head in the sand and not look up, what is the, a first step that they can take? in the direction of having more confidence with finances. Yeah. So there is a first step. And I just want to, before I, I answer that, I do want to say what I think people overlook is the number one reason for divorce in America is finances. Someone either doesn't have, feel like they have too much money. Somebody feels like someone else is out of control. The number one reason for divorce is finances. The number one reason for anxiety is finances. So why do we keep looking the other way? It's time. Yeah. None of us had any great modeling on how to have these financial conversations in a household. But it's time for us to change the generations, right? We have generations. Our children can do better. We can do better than our parents did. And they can do better than we did. If, if finances is the number one reason for divorce and stress in a marriage, gosh, 
Why are we not finding someone to help us with that and have those conversations? I think the big thing I see is people don't have a shared vision of where they want to be in 10 years, in 20 years, because you can get hung up on the little details, but pan back out. What's the shared vision? Is the shared vision that we're going to pay for half of our kids' college? Is the shared vision that, no, we're going to have our kids finance it and we're going to fund our retirement? You, if you don't have a shared vision on your finances, you're not going to get to where you want to go. So that's the big thing. It's like, what's the goal? And again, once you have a goal and then you figure out that path to the goal, that's when the hopelessness stops and the anxiety gets reduced. So what's that first step? I would say, you know, back to that question you asked, what's the first step? Having a vision, having a vision for where you want to be, whether you call it a milestone or a season of your life, you know, well, when the kids are grown, here's where I want to be, or in 10 years, 20 years, what's your retirement vision? Is it shared with your partner? If you don't have a partner, how do you create that vision board for yourself? That shows, okay, you have that vision board, but to get a house on a lake, what are you going to have to do? What has to be, what has to be true to make that happen? It's like, wow, mm, that's a good question. Cut this out. I have to invest more here. So how do you get there? Right? So it's, it's just, it's interesting. That's where always where we start. Step one is what's the vision, which, where do you want to be? And it's yeah. so important in a marriage to have a shared vision. Not one of you doing your thing and saving for retirement on your own over here with someone else doing a little percentage over here. That's a different thing. No, it's together as a household. How much are we going to save? And then you, you yeah. check in monthly. You just check in. And I will share one of the things I loved. One of my clients, so clever. She and I were talking about, she's like, Ugh, the budget, I can't stand it. I hate budget. It just makes my skin crawl. And I was kind of you know chuckling. I was like, I know, I get it. And she said, can we just call it a spending plan? And I loved that. I was like, yeah, it's a spending plan. You're right. You know, you're absolutely right. So I've been using that since then. It's like, instead of saying, hey, it's not in the budget, it's not in my spending plan this month, but here's what we could do. In June, we can purchase this. Or in, you know what, in December, we could probably get that. Or if you contribute this, then I can contribute that. You know, so it, it just starts those great conversations and teaches kids even how to negotiate. Oh, I like that. That's a good, <laughs> another skill right there that they would be benefiting my elbow. Maybe, maybe they could teach us how to negotiate. Cause I actually, I think that the kids are pretty good at the negotiating. At least mine are. <laughs> they are right. And getting all of our money. I know. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So what else would be helpful for our listeners? We've talked about, you know, what is the, the first step? And you talked about that, the shared vision, what else would be helpful specifically for women to demystify or help them to make it feel safer. Because I think that's another thing is it doesn't really feel like a safe space to get into. So what would be helpful for them to know? Yeah, I think for us as women, one, we have, like I said, a lot of different feelings around um, money where guys tend to kind of block off and be more black and white with the numbers. We get a lot of feelings about that. And just recognizing that these two shall pass, <laughs> just take a deep breath, kind of breathe through it, and then just look at the numbers because the, the facts are friendly, right? The data will tell you. And it's really whether it's writing it down, getting a yellow pad or a pad of paper and writing everything out that are your absolute kind of must spend this month. What are all the requirements? And then really what I work with clients on is kind of listing the debts because what we know, again, going back to the data, is debt payments, just tick it up the anxiety meter. For each payment you have, your anxiety is going to go up a notch. So then how do we start ticking those off? And we list them smallest to largest and try and knock out the ones that we can knock out. And that's a, that's a really important thing because then you get your breathing room. And then you can create that emergency fund so that when life happens, the bumps in life, you know, the headlight goes out in the car, the flat tire happens. All of a sudden, kid breaks an arm and you've got medical expenses you weren't anticipating. You know, you have that cushion against those things so that you're not putting it on a credit card or putting it on some kind of payment plan. So it's just really, how do you reduce your anxiety? It's have a shared vision, reduce your debt. That's what the data shows. And it's so interesting because it sounds so simple, yet it's so hard. And the reason for that is they've found that money is 80% behavior, 20% knowledge. So how do we get ourselves to behave? Yeah. Well, I like what you said. The facts are friendly. 
oftentimes when I'm working with people and the finances come up, it's because they're afraid of the facts and it just then snowballs in the opposite direction that they actually want to go. But looking at it as the facts are friendly, they are your friend because when you have, you know, that knowledge, you can make solid choices versus, you know, that head in the sand. So you can do something about it, right? You can take action on it. So you have to have the facts. If you don't have the facts and they are your friends, if you don't have them, again, it creates this hopelessness. It creates this mystery. I sort of kind of know how much I owe. I sort of kind of don't. I mean, I think it's this. I don't think, I think my student loans are this. I'm not sure. I think I owe this much to the IRS. I'm not sure. Like, okay. Like knowing that, having that data, that'll start the confidence. And then it's, what's the path to getting that taken care of? So you don't have to ever worry about it again. And I have them imagine that. Like, imagine if you had no payments in the world, what would you be doing with that money? And people have great dreams around that. And I'm like, well, then let's get there. Right. And some of them are easy to knock out in that 18, 12 month, 18 time period. Some of them are a little bigger and take a little bit more time if there's larger student loans or larger car payment kind of things. But getting those knocked off, too, gives you a sense of control. And I don't know, it just kind of feels heroic when you get one knocked off. Yeah, it's fun. It's kind of like treat yourself. I always say treat yourself. It's a big deal. You did it. Yes. I mean, when you were just talking about the kind of the confusion of what do I owe? I was feeling knots in my stomach just by like the the way that you were saying it, it induced like anxiety in me. And then saying, what if you didn't have that anymore? All of a sudden I felt freer thinking like, what if you didn't have that anymore? And it's almost like, you know, when you say the facts are friendly and when you know the facts, you can see the path there. It's almost reminds me of a flashlight. The more light that you can shine on it, then you can actually see the path that you're on versus just walking blindly to nowhere. Like, you know, you know where the fuck you're going. And then you're just like shocked that you're someplace. Well, <laughs> take the blindfolds off. <laughs> Do you know, it's so funny you say that too, because I'll use this analogy. I use it with my team here in software. Sometimes I say, you guys, you know, our, our goal is December 31st and it's the Super Bowl, December 31st. So just pretend the Super Bowl is December 31st. I was like, and you want to be playing in that game. I was like, what do professional athletes do to get to that Super Bowl? Nobody, but nobody at the Super Bowl gets off the bus and goes, wow, man, I wonder how I got here. It's shocking. This is, this is weird, <laughs> right? I was like, so you're training. Like, it's effort. It's training. And yeah, you're going to have games where you mess up, where you drop the ball. But you know what? You just go back and you look and you're like, man, I thought I had, you know, my spending plan, $500 for restaurants and whatever. And we, I forgot there was an extra birthday or whatever it is, you know, whatever your category is, man, I thought my electric bill was going to be this, but we added heaters to the garage and didn't realize my electric bill was going to be, you know, $300 instead of a hundred dollars. So it's like, it's okay. It's a ball drop, but you go back, you learn it and you course correct. And yet you move on. And I was like, and that's how all the professional athletes do it. They watch their game day tapes. They go back and review where they messed up and they train and they try again with your spending plan. It always takes people, I would say three to four months to fine tune kind of what's really going where and, you know, getting used to like subscriptions, annual subscription. They forgot about that happens in a particular month, things like that. But yeah, so the first, I would say three months can be pretty frustrating on the spending plan, but then people kind of get it. But I always say you're training for the Super Bowl. So you mean that Super Bowl and you're not going to owe a dime to anybody. You have all that money. Think about what you're going to do with it. Think about what you'll invest it in. Think of what you'll be able to do for your family. All that. And how much anxiety you won't have. Be able to sleep at night because you don't know anybody. Right. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, so fascinating to me. It's really, it's really interesting when you dive into that again, the behavior versus our learned knowledge. And a lot of the behavior we hit on it is put your head in the sand. If you don't know the actual number, it might not be so bad. But it turns out it's actually a lot worse. It's hurting you a lot worse than if you actually knew the number. So when you get to the end of your engagement with people, what's different? Yeah, really, I would say what's different is they have a vision. They can see their plan. They recognize that, hey, I have a plan. Life is going to give me a bump, but I'm prepared for the bump. They have this sense of kind of confidence and understanding. And also, I think the big gift is always as we go through this journey is I don't have to know it all. 
Like I don't have to know it all and I don't have to be a money guru to feel confident and in control of what my destiny is. And I think that's a big thing. And I always say to people too, I'm, I'm not an investment professional. And, you know, I think that's when you get to that stage, that's a great place to be. But it's always don't do anything you don't understand. Just if you don't understand it, don't do it. And that can even include payments. So when you're taking out a loan, if you don't understand how much is going toward principal and how much is going toward interest, maybe tap the brakes and pause before you take out that loan. Really look at that amortization table. Look at what does this loan mean to me? How much am I paying in interest and how much am I paying in principal? And do I really want to do that to myself? Is that what I want to do? Right. Because we're making a lot of banks very wealthy. You know, I don't think they need. Yeah. Yeah. So what is one message or piece of advice that you would like to share with our listeners today? Yeah, it's, you know, if I could have my wish, no one would ever take out another car loan again. <laughs> like, I, I'm like, there should be laws against this, you know, because I think it's, it's keeping America down. And we don't realize that we all have very nice cars. We all have incredibly nice cars. I mean, and, and I'll just share that came to my attention, because I had the opportunity to be around someone who was visiting from another culture, they were visiting from South America. And the comment this person made to me was, man, you Americans really like your cars. What is she talking about? We really like our cars. And I had never been to South America, so I didn't really, and then kind of doing some research that apparently they'll drive anything but anything in some of the, some of the places in South America. And I realized then as I was driving down the road, you know, certainly in my area, I don't see anybody with rusty cars or cars without a window or like, I don't see that. And I was like, you know, I get what they're saying. Their perception is. And I'm like, but we're paying a high price for that. We're paying oh, a very high yeah. price. And our price is our retirement. Our price is our sleep. Our price is our anxiety. And that's just one area that I think we've really become very American about, that we always have a newer car and payments are acceptable. You know, that you have payments for life on cars. So if there's one thing I can wave my magic wand is everybody would just pay cash for their cars. So if you have $5,000, you get a $5,000 car. How do you say, because a lot of people, they don't have, you know, a stash of cash. How would you say, what do they do about that? Yeah. Pennies make a dollar, right? So that's my, my grandma's saying pennies make a dollar. So yeah, it's, it's starting to get those. Don't discount the $25 that you're about to spend at Culver's. Don't discount that. And get that into a savings account and instead of maybe swinging by Culver's and instead maybe you go by the grocery store and you get a loaf of bread and some turkey and cheese, right? So you got to figure those things out. Again, it comes back to that behavior, I think, but it is being mindful again around how much am I going to save? Where could I save it? And some of it is reducing some of the things that we don't think about too much. I know one of the biggest areas um, that I find people overspend, myself included, is the grocery store, right? We don't stick to our list. We don't stick to the dollar amount. So even if you're not going to stick to the list, at least stick to the dollar amount that you decided you were going to spend this month, right? And we all need groceries and it's just a very easy place to over and grocery stores are set up that way. They're set up to make us spend more. So it's like, okay, just getting mindful, being mindful about that. Like one area you could potentially save is groceries. Another is maybe subscriptions that you have that you don't use every month, even though it's only maybe $15.99 or $17.99. You know, do you need Netflix and Hulu and Disney and, and, and. So it's like yeah. those little places and then being mindful about taking that money and just getting it in that savings account and knowing again, it's going to take time. Pennies make a dollar though. I like that. Pennies make a dollar. Thank you, grandma. Yes. yes. I think in addition, the other thing I hear in coaching is like, I work so hard. I just deserve to have this or I, my husband deserved to have this or, and I get that. I, I get like working hard and wanting a reward, but sometimes we, we overswing the pendulum. It's like, well, he works so hard. So he deserved the new truck. I'm like, well, it's a $70,000 truck and yeah. you're now not sleeping at night because of the payment and working maybe a job you don't even like and change to a job you don't even like, because now you have these payments and insurance payments that have, you know, kind of hit you in a hard spot. So is that really worth it for his mm -hmm. 15 minute drive to work and back? So it's those things where I think that it's being mindful again of the why behind your buying it. Is it because you think you deserve it? Well, check, check that. Cause maybe there's something else that can 
you know, give that same feeling again, you know, that feeling around treating yourself versus getting yourself into a place you're treating yourself, but it's going to cause more anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. I, this was a while ago. I was listening to something kind of talking about that same thing where you buy something thinking it's going to make you happier and it may last for a day or three days, but then eventually it wears off a hundred percent of the time. And then, yeah, if it, if you're left with a payment for it, so, you know, looking at that why behind it, and then also like, are there any unmet needs that you maybe have and are you needing to be actually happy without right. stuff? Because stuff, I mean, it may hit that dopamine, you know, right away, but then that's going to wear off. And then if you're left with this payment that yeah. truly you shouldn't have and don't need. Well, and there's some fun stuff to do around it too. I will say I did a clothes challenge about two years ago. What was the clothes challenge? The challenge was don't buy one piece of clothing for one year. Who you did this personally? I did it personally. Yeah. Cause that was the challenge. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. Cause the, the premise was again, kind of as Americans, we have a lot of clothes. Hell yeah. We have a lot of shoes. We have a lot of clothes. Yeah. So like for one year, don't buy anything and see how do you feel about it? And it was really interesting. I did have a lot of clothes. Yeah. I really didn't need to buy anything or replenish anything. And I was like, this is really interesting. Did I want new gym clothes to work out in? Yeah, I did. But did I need them? No, I sure didn't. I still had a stack in a pile. So it was just an interesting exercise to go through. And that's one place where then you're saving money each month, not buying. I think I did buy sneakers. I needed to buy a running sneakers. But yeah, it was an interesting challenge for myself personally. Things like that. And the other, the other thing I will say it is very interesting is to buy a car with cash, right? Most of us don't do that. I certainly practice what I preach. So I do that. And I'm telling you when you're at that car dealership and you're going to write a check for a, huh, it's coming out of your checking account. And you're like, am I buying the $40,000 car? Or am I buying the $27,000 car? Like it's hard to write, like to overbuy a car when you're writing a check for it. Yeah. It's like, I don't really need that. That's pretty baller to walk in with a stack of cash. Like I save for this. And then yes, you think, because I know even my son, when he'll go to buy things, when he actually has to do it with his cash, it's like, do I actually want this one? Or, you know, can I do this other one? Maybe it's, you know, cloth seats and it's not the newest model. One place that we've run into this is the the cell phone store, because I swear my kids are always breaking your phones and you get your, you know, your $10 a month payment or your $30. Like it doesn't seem like it adds up, but that shit adds up. Like you're pushing these edges of making yourself just a little bit uncomfortable because, and there's so much learning there. Like, why well, would you buy this super expensive car? Like what about it? And if you have the cash, there's so much golden nuggets within that space of being in that car dealership with cash versus you've got your $400 payment or your $450 payment. Like that doesn't seem like that big of a difference, but times three, four years. Well, what's fascinating about that experience too, that I didn't anticipate was some shame around it, believe it or not, purchasing a car with cash. So when you go into a car dealership and you have cash, they don't like you. They make their money on financing and they're financing. So I never anticipated that. First of all, they didn't believe me. First of all, they're like, yeah, you're, you know, some chick walking in saying you have 40,000 in cash. Sure you do. Right. Like, no, no, it took me seven years to, you know, or whatever. Right. But yeah, it's really interesting because I didn't anticipate, again, it's just our culture. Our, Our culture doesn't want us to do that. They want us to finance. So you've got to be prepared like, no, and I actually feel really proud of it. And it is, I'm going to tell you, like so free not to owe anybody any money. Another great example. I had to replace my cell phone. It broke and I needed it that day. And I was like, okay, how much do I want to spend on a cell phone? I'm like, "Mm, I'm going to spend $500 on a cell phone. So I walked into the cell phone store and I said, I need, I need a replacement phone. And I said, I need to look at anything you have. That's $500 or less. And they just looked at me. They're like, what? Well, what did you have? And I was like, well, I had an iPhone, whatever I had. And then they were like, well, you can only upgrade then one level or something then. And you can get this other one though. And it can be $20 a month or $15 a month on your contract. That's all. I was like, no, 
I'm going to pay cash and I need to know what's 500 and below. And they were like, they didn't even know what to do with me. They were like, oh, okay, oh I'm sure. I do that. They're like, are you just going to pay for it? You're just going to buy it. I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to buy it. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's fascinating all the upsells and things. And again, it's the price of us not sleeping at night. And we don't realize it. So it's like, how do we challenge ourselves to do things differently? And some of it feels uncomfortable. Like I said, it's interesting, even trying to decide, okay, how much am I going to pay for this car? How much are you going to pay for a cell phone? Like you look at it and you're like, you know what? I don't really want to spend $1,500 or $1,200 on a cell phone. There's a whole yeah. lot of other things I'd rather have with that money. Maybe I yes. want new clothes or maybe I want, so it's that spending plan. But yeah, culturally, our culture is built to keep us in debt, normalize it at the expense of our mental health. Keep us in debt and sick. I mean, truly, because when you have that mental health stuff too, you, that plays into then physically you become ill. You're overwhelmed. Shit, this is way bigger, Trisha, than I like. I mean, I knew this, but like, this is some deep shit. It is. This is deep. It, it's big. It's it's almost to me like I just can't believe that we as Americans were so smart and yet we've walked ourselves down this path of allowing these financial institutions to market to us in a way that payments are okay so that they can become rich and we become sick. It's time to stop. It's time to break the patterns. Our kids don't deserve this. We need to get ourselves out of it so we can sleep at night. I kind of went back to grandma saying pennies make a dollar. I'm telling you, my grandma, if, if I had said, yeah, I'm going to sign up for a house for 30 years, she'd be like, yeah, I am mind. You're going to be a hundred when you own that house. Like, what are you talking about? So it's just kind of, it's interesting where like, again, how do we get back to a place where you own your things, you know, and then you sleep at night, the yeah, bank doesn't own, you. own your sanity. I mean, yeah, really you own your, you own your things because you've mindfully purchased what you you know, can do what you can afford. And then you get to sleep at night. You don't owe anybody anything. You can own your own home. You can own your own car. You can own your own cell phone, right? And it shouldn't just be a small percentage that lives that way in America. We're, we're extremely wealthy company. I think we just have to get more mindful and give ourselves the health benefits physically and emotionally. Yeah. I have a lot of takeaways from today. We talked about the car and the cell phone. Like you go in and because I was just there last week and you see like this phone for this plan and this phone, there are no plans for pay in full. There are no plans for save your money and come in and pay in cash. Like, and even to hear this message, you have to search pretty fucking hard to find somebody just sharing your message because all over the internet, all over everywhere, it's payment plan. Buy this. This will make you happy. This yeah. will solve all of your problems. No, 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 it doesn't. It just creates more of them. Even, even make you rich. You can leverage your money by taking out a loan on this and have this rental property. And then you can leverage this and put 5% down here and then leverage this and you have a this and you'll be rich. It's like, okay, one, I may or may not be. You're forgetting the risk of like, maybe somebody doesn't pay me rent that month in that rental, or maybe they run out and break the contract. And then I don't have the money to, because I've leveraged everything I you know, so it's, again, it's so normalized. So how do we break the cycle and make sure our children are growing up feeling confident and in control, right? And, and going down the path of a million payments doesn't give people confidence yeah. and control. It gives it like, I've got to scramble. I've got to keep this job. I've got to, what if some, this happens? What if that happens? So I try to offer, like, there's a different way. I know it'll feel uncomfortable because it's not, you know, culturally the way everything kind of runs. We've just accepted this norm. So don't, Accept the norm, stand up to it, be a badass. This was fantastic. I am so grateful for you and your message. And I know that this will shift people's, shift their perspective. And I think open up their eyes to the possibility of this could be different. I could live differently. I could live really, truly better. Oh, truly. Yes. And it takes a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, but the reward is so great. Oh, yeah. And the reward, like you said, the generational, your people around you will benefit so much from yes. doing this type of work. Your children and your children's marriages and your grandchildren will all benefit. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, if the other wishes besides no car payments is like, never say I can't afford this again. We live in America. 
we can afford it. We might have to make some sacrifices to afford it, but it's like, maybe it's just not in the spending plan this month, but we can. So it's like, don't say it. We, we live in a place where we can figure things out and saying like, hey, it's not in the plan this month, but I'll have a plan teaches our children. Oh, you come up with a plan to get the things you want. Yeah. Which that's a very easy thing. That's a very easy shift from we don't have the money to, you know, it's it's not in the plan this month, but we'll come up with a plan. We'll come up with a plan. And empowers them to, we'll come up with a plan. I can come up with a plan. Right. Mm-hmm. We got this. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. All right. Last question. I ask everyone, what is your number one life hack or tip that has helped you save time, energy, or resources? Boundaries. Yes. Tell me a little bit more on that one. I know. (laughs) I know it's not typical, but yeah, life balance isn't about time management, but it's about boundary management. And I had to study boundaries. So there's a ton of different great things out there on boundaries, Dr. Henry Cloud and um, Vicki Palmer, but boundaries, learning to say no, right? That's really hard for us people pleasers and people who want everything to be smooth and everyone to be happy. But boundaries, really learning what gets your time, who gets your time, what gets your money, what doesn't get your money. And so that has freed up time in my life where I don't feel as overwhelmed and rush, rush, rush to everything. And I'm more productive. Boundaries. Thank you. That's a, that is a good one and can be applied to all. (laughs) Thank you, Alicia. Thank you so much. This was so valuable. If someone would like to get in touch with you, what's the best way that they can connect with you? Yeah, I'm out there on LinkedIn. So you can find me, Trisha Loy, on LinkedIn, Madison, Wisconsin area. But yeah, you'll see it, regional vice president for a publicly traded company, like we said earlier. But yeah, I'm out there. So hit me up on LinkedIn and we can connect. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Alicia. All right. Have a great one. You too. Bye. Bye. Spirit of a Badass is a Lit Path Studios podcast and is produced by Jamie Gale and Alicia Jacobson. Music by Shane Ivers. We'll be back with another inspiring interview. Until then, keep your spirits high and your energy badass.